Hello and welcome to another episode of Steel Fur Speaks with, of course, me, Steel Fur, knocking over bottles, uh, aka Finbar, UK-based content creator slash flesh and blood player. Um, very happy to continue sort of this series of my road to national sort of primers of the decks you're likely to encounter in the top eight, a summary of their main threats, how to play against them, what to be aware of. Obviously, that's all quite matchup dependent, but this will give you a basic understanding of the main abilities to watch out for, what maybe you need to think about blocking out, where to be, sort of where to where you're going to fall afoul and make mistakes and what to be aware of, uh, and generally just the gameplay and the style of each of the, the heroes that you're going to come up against so that you're not surprised when you sit down against um, a Katsu or a Viserai and they don't attack you for two turns except to stab you or to do something small. So that's what we're here to discuss. Um, just worth noting that once I've done this video, I'm probably going to take a break because I have put out one video a day this week and that's very aggressive content scheduling for me. Um, expect another video from me when we get some results in from the Road to Nationals, maybe from LSS um, tomorrow. Uh, and then I'm going to run through sort of the Road to Nationals winning decks that we've seen um, in their article, whenever they put that out. Um, and then, of course, after the weekend, when we've seen a few more Road to Nationals come in and be talked about um, after the weekend that we've had, I'll do sort of an update video and see if there are any interesting new decks that we can talk about and things that people have seen that might be kind of enjoyable and interesting. But not probably a video tomorrow or over the weekend, just because I need to take a break. Um, so just to let you know about that. But of course, thank you for watching. And of course, if this is your first video that you're watching here, please do um, give a like and subscribe. Uh, it really does help let me know that I'm doing a good job and that people want to see what I'm doing. And it makes me kind of, you know, feel uh, encouraged. Let's put it that way to keep putting out videos for you guys. So please do that. So in this second part, so I do encourage you to watch part one. Uh, we are looking at the other five heroes that are on my list of decks that you might run into in the top eight of a tournament. So we looked at... Um, you know, Bolton, Bravo, Dash, and Dorinthia, um, and the other one, uh, and another one in the last video. Uh, so you can check that out, and I'll put the link in the box below. Um, and of course, we have done also deck techs and some game streams this week. Um, and I am taking requests for heroes you would like to see me play against with either Katsu, or you can select the hero I'm playing as long as it's within reason. Um, <laughs> I don't really feel like building a Kano deck, but I can probably get um, certain pairings if I ask my friends if we can play together. So do let me know if there is a particular matchup or a game you want to see, and I'll try and set that up. Um, in the meantime, obviously we're pushing on with our list. Uh, today, I'm not going to dive too much into Katsu Agro, uh, because I have a whole other video about that which is a massive deck tech, but I will just give you a quick highlight. So obviously Katsu, the first time an attack action you control hits this turn, you can discard a card that costs zero. If you do search your deck for a card with combo, banish your face up and then shuffle your deck, you may play it this turn. So it's important to note, this isn't when the first attack action they play hits, it's when the first attack action they control hits. So if you fully block the first one, if they hit with the second one, they can still trigger this ability. Um, if you fully block two and they hit with the third one, they can still trigger this ability. Because of that, you know, you can't, you know, you can stop it by blocking everything, but otherwise it is probably going to get through. So really what you need to do is try and figure out and try and play around the fact that this may go off and try and minimize the effect by either completely blocking the card they fetch or by blocking the card that they have the resources to pay for. So example, if I come in with a leg tap, and I don't have that many cards in my hand, I may not have a Rising Knee Thrust, you block the leg tap, then suddenly I don't have another leg tap to start that combo again, which means that even if I hit you with, say, a head jab after that, I'm not going to go and fetch a Rising Knee Thrust. If I have the resources, I might go and get a Open the Center, but that costs two, so I may not be able to pay for it. So blocking that first attack is often a good idea against Katsu, because you're kind of challenging the deck to have this answer in your hand um, as in i block the leg tap do you have a rising knee thrust if you do then obviously you're going to play it anyway i wasn't going to stop you um but at least you know but if you didn't have it then i'm not giving you um, the free option to search for it so katsu is all about these combo lines so leg tap into rising knee thrust which then gets plus two and go again if you played leg tap first into hurricane technique which bounces back into your hand gets go again then you have the big line which everyone always gets well often blocks wrong which is searching strike 
um, into Whelming Gust Wave, which gets plus one go again if it hits draw a card, into Magenshin Release, which gets plus one go again if it hits get any number of Lord of Winds, and then Lord of Wind, which lets you pitch extra resources equal to the number of cards from the line you've seen before in your discard pile um, and get plus X to that amount of damage. So it's a really impactful combo. Um, what is the correct way to block this is often the question I get asked. Um, and really it is often at the start. So um, you could either fully block the Surging Strike for five or four if I play the yellow one, or you can fully block the Whelming Gust Wave. It is often better if you're playing a more defensive deck to block the Searching Strike and then I may not have the Whelming Gust Wave, right? Because I haven't searched for it. And if that happens, then I just have to do something naff, maybe attack you with just a Scar for Scar, and end my turn. Okay? If you don't block the Searching Strike, then I have the option to get Whelming Gust Wave. I usually will. If I have Mugenshin already, um, I'll get that. If I fetch Mugenshin, then I definitely have Whelming Gust Wave. Um... But if I hit you with a Surging Strike, so say you fully block this for six, and then I come in with a, a, well, a, a Whelming Gust Wave, also block this for five, right? That may be your whole turn, but you've effectively shut down my combo. So if you're playing a defensive deck, that's a good idea. If you're playing an aggressive deck, you might let the Surging Strike hit, you might then block the Whelming Gust Wave so I don't get the on-hit effect, and my turn will probably end there. However, you are opening yourself up to a risk, because, of course, if you see me fetch McGenshin release, it means I already have the Whelming Gust Wave, and then you're really leaving yourself open to the full combo if you don't block. But in that situation, um, so if I hit you with a Surging Strike and I fetch McGenshin release, you may consider not blocking the Whelming Gust Wave and fully blocking the McGenshin release. And the real decision maker there is, how many cards do I have that Lord of Wind can shuffle back into my deck? How many Lord of Winds do I have left in my deck? Can I fetch three of them, pitch two of them, and come in for for eight? You know, that's the consideration. So um, there's a lot of things going on there. It is worth gaining reps against Katsu and trying to figure out which point you need to be blocking. Is it some? Is it all? Is it surging? Is it whelming? You can really get a feel. You kind of have to read your Katsu opponent, try and figure out what they have, how many cards they have left in their hand, what resources they're showing on the table, um, have they kept a resource open after pitching a blue? That means they may have Mugenshin already and have a plan to play it because they have that floating resource. Otherwise, they may just Kodachi you again. They may do some tricks. It's also worth remembering that Katsu does have a lot of combat tricks like Ancestral Empowerment for plus one, Razor Reflexes for plus three, um, and the uh, Breaking Scales for plus one. Therefore, if you're going to block something like Something that has combo, so not surging strike, something like Whelming Gust Wave. Don't just block it for four if, if you've got a braces, breaking scales face up on the table. Try blocking it for five. Um, you can't really stop a razor reflex without overcommitting massively on the block, so be careful when you do that. Um, you know, the odds of someone having an ancestral and the breaking scales are somewhat high, but not always guaranteed. You could block for six if you really feel worried about that, but usually blocking for five is the right idea. Um, so that's it really. If you want more views on Agro Katsu, go to my deck tech video, which um, will be pretty clearly labeled, which is this deck broken down a bit further. Uh, but let's move on. So when I said I was doing this video, I said that I was talking about um, three, I was talking about nine or ten decks, right? Not um, nine or ten heroes. And that's because Control Katsu is a thing that exists. Um, and essentially, how do you spot a control katsu? It is in the defense um, reactions. Um, I don't know if this is the perfect um, example of it. This is just what I think gives me enough to talk through. Um, when you sit down against a control katsu, you can often spot them because they're running Breeze Rider boots. Um, and that's because it has one defense and it gives them the ability to get some go again on their combos. Not that they run that much combo. Uh, the main things to call out really is just the number of defense reactions. Fate for Scene, Flick Flack... Um, and sink belows, um, as well as more flick flacks. And basically, aggro, whereas aggro katsu is like, I'm coming at you with these combos. Are you going to block? Are you going to take tons of damage? Defensive katsu is very much, I'm going to block as much as you, I can. Where possible, I'm going to keep a blue. I'm going to kadachi you twice and deal two damage. And then maybe play another one of my big threat cards, like my nourishing emptiness like my Exude Confidence, like my Command and Conquer, to get a draw off Mask and then end my turn, right? So how do you play against that? You obviously have to expect to get blocked a lot. 
you have to set up for bigger turns, wider turns, depending on what you're playing, um, so they can't block you. You know, you have to get dominate. You have to get all of your tricks out, basically, to break through that defense. Um, and, you know, that's really how you're going to win. The only other option, really, is to block out the big swing they do once a turn and take the damage from the Kodachi so they're not drawing off Mask of Momentum. Um, and just be wary of that big swing coming in. So wary of that nourishing emptiness or that pounding gale or that, you know, any of these big threats that they're going to drop at you at the end, like a torrent of tempo. And just be aware of those and be prepared to block them. Don't be surprised if they have two cards in their hand and they go pitch a blue, stab, stab, you know, come in for six. Um, they'll basically just try and do that every single turn. Um, the way you kind of stop them from keeping the level of pressure up is by making them block with three cards rather than two. If they block with three cards, then they're only going to be able to Kodachi you twice. They're not going to come in with the massive um, extra kick. So, you know, try and get them to block for three where possible. But Katsu players are very much, you know, quite good at just defending and, and giving themselves options that aren't just um, block, block, Kodachi. Anyway, let's move on from that because I don't want to talk about Katsu for too long. I feel like a lot of people have played against some form of ninja control, whether it was Ira control or Katsu control. Um, so, it, you know, they will have already had the experience of, de of dealing with this. Um, so I think it's worth just, you know, having a bit of a talk about it and having a think about how you break through that. Um, and if you can get some reps against this deck and practice breaking through their defense, um, whether that's be by using Command and Conquers or just by building up a big turn that they can't fully block, um, playing its Control Katsu is a really good way to practice your Control matchup because it is just an epitome of the Control deck archetype. So let's move on from there to Prism. Um, this is kind of like a standard Prism deck. Um, aka called Prism Switch, which means it basically has enough um, cards to switch between running Auras and running Heralds. Um, you have decks that kind of sit more towards Heralds or more towards um, Auras, but this is really like a good example of just a deck that will sideboard into either, and it kind of gives you an idea that when you're playing against Prism, you don't really know what they're going to play until you sit down against them and see how they're hitting you. Most Prism players are just coming in with Herald aggro, which means they'll play a big Herald, like a Herald of Judgment or a Herald of a Wartune Herald, and then they'll come in with a second Herald as long as they have the yellows. Um, they love doing like a Wartune Herald, which you might block for seven, and then coming in with a Herald of Erudition, which obviously has Dominate. Um, my advice to you if you're playing against Prism is to keep your armor... Um, keep your defense reactions for the Herald of Erudition. Don't just throw it away um, early on something. But equally, don't keep the cards in your hand too long because that's how you lose tempo against a really aggressive deck. You kind of need to get to the point where you're making Prism block with at least one card a turn because if she is, she can't do two attacks against you unless she has something in Arsenal. So if you can get Prism blocking, say an on-hit effect, something that Katsu does quite well, with that... Um, card from hand they need a minimum of four cards in order to do two heralds a turn and that's how you get the pressure off you against prism if you just let them keep a four card hand and don't put any pressure on them then they can just hit you and hit you and hit you whereas if you do keep the pressure up you can make them block and that will get you that opening where they're only coming in for say one herald of judgment a turn or a herald of erudition a turn that you can just break with some armor um it is worth keeping your six costs in your hand um, at the end of a turn and just keeping them and just thinking, okay, what am I going to break? I will say don't fall into the trap. A lot of prison players have started running stuff like Raging Onslaught, stuff like um, Command and Conquer, stuff like um, Barraging Broadhide, those big attacks to, to help them in the prison mirror matchup. Don't fall into the trap necessarily of holding on to your attack um, for the second Herald, because sometimes it will be bait and they will just come in with a Raging Onslaught that you can't break with your six strength. A lot of the time it is right to just pop that first Herald they play um, with um, the six cost. The time I will say to be careful of it is if the first attack they do is a Wartune Herald and they're still floating one resource or two resources, um, just be aware that a Judgment or a Tome is very likely from that situation. Um, or an erudition from that situation so maybe you take the damage from the war tune for example be prepared to break the erudition or whatever comes after the war tune hits um 
So that's kind of just like there's a there's a lot of reading of Prism to try and figure out what their thread is. I will say that often it is worth just breaking their their first. Oh, sorry, I just found a foil tear limb from limb on my desk. That's fun. It is worth breaking the first herald they play against you just to to take it out of the hand, and then if they have to spend the resources for um for the footsteps, which of course gives them go again if you break their attack, um then you may actually get out of it. Um, so just a reminder, sorry, I realized I didn't really cover Prism's abilities. Obviously, most of her heralds have Phantasm, which means that if you block with a 6 or str higher strength attack, um, she will stab you. Um, she, Sorry, they will blow up um, and the combat chain will end. That means anything like Command and Conquer. It is worth noting a lot of Prism's play things like Herald of Triumph, uh, which gives minus 1, which means stuff like Command and Conquer will not break it. Um, it is worth noting that and just holding on to your Command and Conquers for the next aura they for the next thing they play. Don't please, and I've seen this happen in too many Road to Nationals so far. Do not misread Her Herald of Triumph and waste a Command and Conquer blocking it. Your opponent will not and will not and should not let you take it back. Um, so you will have just thrown away one of your six costs on a Herald of Triumph. So don't do that. Be very careful you're not blocking a Herald of Triumph. Any of the other ones, chuck down the Command and Conquer. Have yourself a laugh. No one is playing really stuff like Binding Beam or anything like that that would reduce the strength of your attacks. Um, so you can pretty much block anything except the Herald of Triumph. But there's a reason that Prism is playing nine Heralds of Triumph there. Um, the other thing to be aware of, of course, is to check whether or not they have Go Again. Um, the Luminaris, which is their weapon, requires them to pitch a yellow in order to get Go Again on their Illusionist attacks. If you see that your Prism opponent has pitched a blue, you can rest assured that they will not probably be coming at you with a second attack. The only time I would counter counteract that advice is just be very aware of the number of cards in their hand and their arsenal. If they still have quite a few, they may in fact be running a pummel and they could pitch a yellow to play the pummel, right? In order to get that um get that go again. Okay, so if they've still got three cards left, so they started with a card in Arsenal, they may in fact pummel that to get go again and they may come in with another attack anyway. But that does kind of depend how many resources they have, for example. So they pitch a blue, they have one floating. They need to pitch a yellow for pummel and then they need to have, um, you know, another, another yellow and another attack. And they will also then be out of Arsenal. So it's not like the end of the world because they'll have given you a lot of their setup. But just be aware that that is a combo that could also happen. So don't just assume pitch to blue, I'm safe. But equally, if they have pitched to blue, just keep an eye on it. Um, some prison players, especially newer ones, will forget that their go again isn't on all the time. So you will have that risk of they'll pitch a blue and then assume they have go again. And they will have just made that mistake. So it is worth just keeping an eye on it. The other thing to be aware of, of course, is Prism shields that she can create. Um, spectral shields just block one damage when they hit, but Luminaris can give them all go again if you pitch a yellow. Um, they can also, if they've pitched a blue, if they don't have pummel, they can pitch a yellow to make a shield to get go again on the attack. Um, and that is a trick, again, lots of Prism players like to do, just because it you block the attack thinking they don't have go again, then they give themselves go again and they have that option then um, of doing things. So, you know, just worth being aware. Don't let yourself be pulled into those tricks where they don't have go again and they give themselves go again. Uh, or, you know, do you think they'll have go again, but they don't because they haven't pitched right? Just make sure you're always checking what is in the prison player's pitch zone um, and just being aware of, uh, of whether or not they have go again and what they could do to get it. Um, I think we just have a, a, a small note on um, Library of Solana. It's not actually very good. Um, lots of people are worried that this card is very good and they have to put it in their Prism decks. But actually, the turn you play it may be the only turn you ever actually get the bonus. Um, assuming you can pitch two yellows to do something on your turn and then still pay for Library, again, requiring a four-card hand. Um, so, you know, it's a bit tricky. Um Unless, you know, you make a shield and then you play library, but then you're not putting any pressure on your opponent, which is, again, not really so good. I have played games against people who put out Solana against the wrong opponent and essentially have never, ever been able to keep enough cards in hand because they've had to block on hit effects to actually get the, the library's bonus on their turn again. So it was just a dead card in their deck because you can't pitch it or block with it. So they had to play it. They didn't have a choice, but it cost them a turn in terms of tempo. So if you're playing Prism, maybe take this out against more aggressive decks. 
feel free to put it in against Bravo. Prism loves it when they get a um, library and play against Bravo. It's really good in that matchup. Against other people, not so much. Um, against Bravo, you will also put in your auras, things like that, which are really good against him. Um, and you'll probably cut some of your more aggressive reds and just be prepared for a bit of a slower matchup. So that's Prism, really. Prism is one of those really odd heroes that a lot of people are afraid of because she's new and very powerful. And yes, she can put in a 5-strength attack and then a 7-strength attack. And she can Tome of Divinity and draw 3 cards. But Prism is not actually winning all that much because essentially... For the reason I said, to maintain aggression, Prism has to keep four card hands, which means that Prism is actually suffering quite heavily because there's a very aggressive meta coming out with Chain and Katsu, who basically are saying to Prism, well, you can keep a four card hand, but here's all my on-hit effects. Are you happy with that? And they can't take all the on-hit effects and still win. Like, they can't let Katsu draw two cards a turn. They can't let Chain discard a card from their hand with Consuming Volition or get Shadow Puppetry every turn. Or, um, you know, or come through with, um, with, uh, what's the card I'm thinking of? Command and Conquer, because that's really going to screw with their game plan. So they're forced into blocking, which then means that those aggressive turns that Prism promises on paper, where you're coming in with, with two heralds every turn, don't actually materialize. And that's the biggest thing that Prism has to contend with, is that the reality of her deck is that she can only attack once a turn for six, um, and she's forced into blocking because of the aggression in the meta. Um, and then she kind of ends up just playing quite a lot like Bravo, which is that she has these one attacks for six or for seven, um, these big threatening swings, maybe a few extra pings from something small. And then she has to block with her other two cards, but she doesn't block as well as Bravo. So, you know, if you wanted a control style deck, you're actually better off playing the Bravo deck we talked about yesterday or something similar rather than playing something like Prism. Because Bravo is actually better at handling those aggressive RTN top eights than Prism is, which is why we see a lot of... We basically, we see a lot of Prism players in Road to Nationals because she is A, a new hero... And popular, people like the aesthetic, the art is gorgeous. I mean, all of these heralds, I have some foil heralds that I got given um, by uh, one of the other content creators who I played yesterday. That was Findell's Library, who is giving those out to people who play him in tournaments. So there was a foil herald of protection, and they're absolutely gorgeous, like they're 100% gorgeous. Um, and all of Prism's art is gorgeous. But the other thing, of course, to remember is that aside from Command and Conquer, Prism is very much a Monarch-based hero. So if you started the game in Monarch, you can build a deck quite easily, mostly relying on Prism cards from Monarch. So for a lot of new players who got into the game, she is a very attractive hero. Not in the same way that Chain is, because Chain obviously takes E and E strikes and Command and Conquers and quite a few other old cards from the Runeblade set, but also the same way that Bolton is, because Bolton relies quite heavily on all of his light cards. This is the reason those three heroes are really popular, um, and that is partly because of that. Um, just a note here, of course, this art is Phantom Clasms. Uh, it's a neutral illusionist card, um, and there is kind of a spear theme going on here, um, which may be a bit of a preview towards our new champion that's coming out in Aria, which is going to be a warden so maybe we'll see a warden riding on a snake um you know as kind of our um as our uh as our option sorry i've got out of this i just want to remind myself of this later on um yeah let me open that i want to talk about that a bit um because i am st i am currently trying to speculate what the new aria hero is going to be and i think it could actually very well be something like this spear wielding snake rider that we see here um, because illusionists in Aria are supposed to be quite a big deal, um, and this is obviously uh, a god summoning a load of animals, but you know it could equally be something based in, say, Aria coming out with all of these illusions. We've got a, you know, we've got a unicorn there. We've got a snake riding the archer. We've got some sort of fish creature back here. Um, you know, they're all quite fantastical and fae-like. So you know, maybe this is a a bit of a hint as to what. And a lot of the other art for illusionist um, non-light cards does look Aria-themed, which has led a lot of people to speculate that Tales of Aria will have an illusionist in, which I don't think is true. Um, I think that maybe we'll get a Tales of Aria, an Aria illusionist in a later set, but I think they're not going to revisit illusionist straight away. 
Anyway, that tangent aside, because I do want to finish this video sometime today, we're going to move on to Rhino. So Rhino is a really brilliant aggressive deck, and this is the one that won uh, Road to Nationals in Amsterdam. I don't think it was the biggest road to nationals but it was definitely reasonably well attended um and the player who won it is someone called eric who is a former world champion from legend of the five rings so i know him quite well um and he's just you know he's a really sort of intelligent controlling player who makes very clean plays and, and understands the decks he plays very well so let's start off with sort of the weapons so rider will decide to go aggro or control against you often these decks are kind of just aggro uh there is a control variant of rider you can't really tell when you sit down unless they play the mandible claws if they play the claws they're definitely going aggro against you um if they play the club you won't be able to tell um the control deck always plays the club but the aggro deck does as well it just depends whether or not they think they're going to be able to do two attacks in a turn or whether they think they're going to need to do one big attack a turn the gear is fairly straightforward you know the skull cap the tunic uh, the Gambler's Glove, which lets you re-roll a dice, which is solely there to stop yourself losing the game due to scab skin leathers, which you're going to roll to um, get a get action points equal to the number of rounded down. So six, six, roll a six, get three action points. Uh, roll a five, get two. Roll a four, get two. Roll a three, get two. Uh, get one. Uh, roll a one, get zero. Um, sometimes you do just roll a one and you lose your turn, which is why these are a risky card. But obviously, if you roll a six, you're going to be doing a lot of damage that turn. Rhino's hero ability, when you discard a card with six or more strength during your attack, Intimidate Intimidate takes a random card out of your hand and banishes it face down. Um, at the beginning of the end phase, return all cards banished away to your hand. Intimidate is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it lets you get through massive attacks that don't block, that can't be blocked. On the other hand, it also means your opponent has a full hand to come back at you, um, even if, you know, and you've hit them, but they still get a full hand to do stuff to you on your next turn. You're not really dealing with the threat the way people are if they're being blocked. You are, in fact, just postponing the threat to a later stage when your opponent can actually come back and deal damage to you. So it is a double-edged sword, but it does kind of replicate that idea of, you know, the roots are so scary and then you're you can't do anything and they hit you and then once they've hit you you're like okay cool now i've got to do something now um the main threats in beast um sorry in brute stuff like alpha rampage it comes in you discard a card it intimidates if you discard a, a six or more attack it intimidates twice um so that's a really strong card it costs three so they have to pitch a blue for it but it is really good uh barraging beatdown gives the attack plus four if it's not defended by less than two non-equipment cards it also intimidates so you can already see how if i play alpha rampage after playing barraging beatdown and i discard a six strength attack which will be the only other card in my hand i will intimidate three times which means you can't actually trigger the ability on barraging beatdown unless you have a defense reaction in arsenal and then you will be coming at i'll be coming at you for nine sorry for 13. then we have breakneck battery in which discards a random card if it has six or more you not only do you intimidate but you also get go again we have command and conquer which of course has six power we have some defense reactions just to deal with um dorinthia and other big attacks we have massacre which gets intimidate um, it also intimidates if you discard a card, discard it for a cost. So with this combo up here, you could get four intimidates and just have your whole hand sitting next to you. And that is often how Rhydar closes out games, um, just by getting you down to enough health that he can intimidate your entire hand and then just smack through. But it is not, not necessarily the easiest thing to set up, but it is quite strong. Um, we see... We see pack hunts, just a regular attack. Pulping is great. Um, discard a random card. If two, if six or more is discarded this way, you get dominate, which is really good. And then, of course, it, if it's defended by less than two or one equipment attacks, it gets go again. So you can dominate and get go again via the dominate if they don't have a defense reaction at Arsenal. The art is also just mad. He hits someone so hard that they just, like, melted. Um, Savage Feast is a fairly straight attack. Arc Smash is very interesting. This is an anti-mech um, card that goes into Rhydar. Um, basically, you just put it in against mech. You don't really put it in against anyone else unless you think they're really going hard on potions. Uh, basically, it just lets Rhydar literally smash uh, mech by just destroying their um, induction chambers and their plasma purifiers, and it really just turns that match up on its head. Um, then we've got more Barrage Beatdowns, Barrage Bighorns, 
um, which gets go again as well if you don't defend. You'll see all of these have a cost uh, of discard a card, and you think that's expensive, but uh, obviously discarding a card triggers a lot of effects for Brute, and you can kind of control it so that you pitch the card that wouldn't trigger the effect, and the only card left in your hand is something that does trigger the effect. Uh, Beast Within flips over cards from their deck that gets a card into their hand, um, and you can do it by discarding, so you can discard... Something with a Baraji Bighorn, discard a Beast Within, get out another 6 attack, get go again from this, and then come in with the other attack. Blood Rush Bellow, obviously, uh, if you discard a 6 or more card cost, you draw 2, so this is a really eff efficient card. And it gives all your Brute Attacks plus 2, which includes the Claws. Um, uh, a, co a common combo turn with Blood Rush Bellow is, of course, to play two of them, get two Intimidates off Rhydar's ability, and then go into something like an Alpha Rampage for 13, or two Claw Swings for 7 and 7. And there's lots of really strong combos in Rhydar that can really sort of get um, get aggressive with its opponent. Um, is there anything else really to talk about? Last Ditch Effort is probably in this just against decks that are going to try and fatigue you and defend against you and also because Rhydar does chunk, chunk through a lot of his deck by discarding cards and drawing cards um Scat, sand sketch plan just fetches you anything and gives you action points which is really good um snag is good tail in problem is a bit random uh it's not really a threat but it can be really good um basically doubles the attack of the next card uh makes its base it gets plus plus its base not not doubles the bonus, but, you know, if you get double on an Alpha Rampage, that's coming in for 18. Um, and you've discarded a card, which could intimidate as well. Uh, right has a pretty straightforward game plan. You kind of just need to block the attacks when you can. Most heroes just try and get uh, a free, importantly, a free defense reaction into Arsenal. You don't want to put something like unmovable into your arsenal against Rhydar. In fact, I cut it from my Katsu deck when I play against Rhydar. Because the last thing I want is to have that card in my inbox not in my inbox sorry i am on a computer um that card in my arsenal and not have any cards left in my hand to pitch it so flick flack stay in um great as an option to basically keep me alive if he's coming at me with a lot of damage and my hand is intimidated but something like unmovable is actually a trap you think you need it to block these big attacks but realistically you may not be able to block the attack that you really need to so it's worth not playing that card or you know maybe just not playing as many of them versus brute in case it goes against you that being said Four, four Intimidate card turns are not super common, so if you are running Unmovables, um, you should be able to play them through quite a bit of the game, um, but it is worth noting that as you get to the later game and you're less life, they could be more of a liability than a threat. Um, so there we go. I've shown you all sort of the big attacks. I've talked to you about Intimidate. Brute is fairly straightforward. Um, they do block a lot more than people think they do because Brute is very, very happy to just, you know, chuck down a blue and come in with... Um, you know, a massive attack um, rather and block with two cards um, than they are, you know, just to come at you with a full hand because they don't have tons of go again, um, especially unconditional go again. So it's a lot easier for them to block a bit and do a big attack than it is to just go big attack, big attack, big attack. Um, but be warned, if you want to stop them getting go again, you are going to have to defend a lot of their cards um, like Pulping, like Baraji, Bighorn, and that is how you're going to stop them. It is probably worth stopping them getting go again, um, just because obviously coming for six and then coming in for nine or coming in for six and then coming in for another six is much more threatening than just coming in for six and being blocked out. Um, so let's move on to the last deck of this series, which is Viscerai. Um, I originally wasn't going to put Viscerai in because I think the Viscerai is a solid uh, B-tier deck. Um, I think it can win if the field is right and the wind is blowing in the right direction. I don't think it is super consistent. Um, and I don't think I've seen it do very well at some of the larger RTNs, but it has done okay at some of the smaller ones. Um, his ability, important to understand, whenever you play a Runeblade card, if you played another non-attack action card this turn, create a Rune Chant token. So that means if, for example, I play a Tome of Findel, 
um, and I get go again via Mage Master's Boots. Every Rune Blade card I play after that point is going to generate me another Rune Blade token. And this is an OTK deck. So what that means is I'm going to build up something called Rune Chants by playing abilities and getting one from this. A Rune Chant token is basically an aura that says when I play an attack action or attack with a weapon, destroy Rune Chant and deal one arcane damage to target opposing hero. The Viserai OTK deck basically plans to build up enough of those to kill their opponent in one turn. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have 40 of them, but you may have 40 of them at, or 30 of them at a really big um, attack. For example, you may have 34 at a big attack with Dominate and a bonus as well, maybe. Um, and generally, you'll keep that option available to yourselves. It does not mean that Viserai can't attack you before they have that many rune chants. If they feel like they need to put pressure on you to stop you from winning, they will, by all means, attack you earlier, and you ha will have to do with that. So, how do they do this? They play things like Mordred Tide, which creates rune chants plus one. So if I make three, I make four. If I make one from Viserai, I make two. So if I play Mordred Tide and then I play Read the Runes, I will make... Um, I will make four, six rune chants, and that will be a good turn. If I can somehow fit um, something bigger, like a Whisper of the Oracle in first, then I will make um, six rune chants, which will, sorry, seven rune chants, which will be better. Um, there's a lot of cards in here, like Enchanting Melody and things like that, that are just designed to slow down the game. There's a lot of defense reactions, like Fate for Seen. Um, there's and um, and Reduced to Rune Chant, which gets you more Rune Chants, some Sink Belows. Um, it is worth noting that Viserai, Viserai does play um, stuff like Lead the Charge. Um, that is kind of... You know, in there as tech against Prism, I guess, just to help you get around um something like an arc light sentinel with um with your kill turn so if you're going in for the kill and they play something you can play need the charge to get an action point and go around it um, it is worth noting the big thing that gets people confused about rune chants um and spectra from prism so we saw from prism we have these spectra on stuff like genesis and arc light sentinel um when a card with spectra is attacked the attack gets destroyed, the combat chain choke closes, and the attack does not resolve. If you're playing Viserai, um, when you play an attack action is when your rune chants trigger, or when you attack with a weapon. This is something that always seems to confuse people, um, because when you play a card, it happens before you attack with a card. If you play an attack action, your rune chants will explode. If you attack with a weapon into a spectra, they will not because the attack will be cancelled before the attack will trigger the rune chance. So that's just worth remembering for all of you want, uh, you know, people playing against Viserai and all of you want to be Viserai players out there. If you're playing against uh, Prism and you attack with a non-attack action, your rune chance do not get do get spent. If you attack with a non-attack uh, with sorry, if you attack with your weapon, your rune chance do not get spent. Which means even Viserai can swing into Spectra and get them off the table without worrying about using his rune chance up as long as he is doing it with his weapon, okay? That's important to remember, and it is an important part of the Viserai Prism matchup. Okay, the main combo then here that actually wins the game is you take all of these lovely, lovely rune chants that you've been building, you pop this blood sheath skeleton, which makes your next attack action and non-attack action cost one less to play for each rune chant you control, then you go down to this new card in Monarch called Sedata Arcanix, which is a bit complicated on the face of things, but isn't actually, where you reveal the top X plus three cards of your deck, and it's got two Xs in the cost. Now, what that means is that you declare a number, and then you pay that number twice, and the cost of this card becomes that number times two. So if I say three for Sedata, then the total is six, I have to pay six, uh, and then I reveal nine cards. If I say 16, I have to pay um, 32 and I reveal the top um, 19 cards right so Bloodshe Skeletor reduces the card for each rune chant I control if I have 16 rune chants I can name 16 and I can play this for sorry I can name 8 and I can play this for um, 8 cards plus 3 if I have 32 rune chants I could name 16 uh, half the number of rune chants you have and then you flip cards from the top of your deck 
put them in two piles for attack actions and non-attack actions. Um, and bet that when, once you've done that, you can put one attack action into your hand for every non-attack action you revealed. Once you've done that, you should have a lot of meet and greets. Ninth Blade of the Blood Oath. You should have stuff like... Um, um, where is it? Uh, Arc Knight Ascendancy should be in here somewhere. It's not. I thought it would be. Um, interesting. I thought that was the card that this deck would rely on to finish things off, but apparently not. Uh, anyway, you'll have a big attack. You'll have some go again through meet and greet, and you'll have a lot of rune, rune chance to trigger, and you'll basically pitch whatever you need to get in. You'll definitely get the go again on meet and greet from all the rune chants, um, and then you can hit them a couple of times a turn, get the go again from those. Um, and you can get um, some Moravian Skies if you've got them in your hand to get go again. Um, and basically just once you've flipped that and you've gone for as much as you can from Sonata, you try and kill them. There's a lot of subtlety to this deck because obviously you're not attacking, which means that your opponent is coming at you with five card hands every turn. And you're just defending, 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 but you also have to keep some cards in your hand, like Mordred Tide, like Read the Runes, to generate those rune chant tokens. So you can't just... You know, it's it's a very difficult deck because you basically have to play the defensive for like three or four turns, getting these rune chants, getting set up, while your opponent basically hammers you with everything they've got. And that's one of the reasons that I consider this to be a B-tier deck and not something that you're going to commonly see in a lot of Road to Nationals top eight. And that is because of Chain, of Katsu, of um, Agro Bravo, you know, all of the Agro meta that we're currently in, including Prism, all those decks, if left unchecked, can just smack you around um, to the point where you are on less health than they need to worry about. So my experience, for example, playing Agro into Viserai as a Katsu player is, okay, well, he has 24 rune chance, that's kind of scary, but I've taken him down to 21 life on turn four. Um, okay, and I'm on 40 health because he hasn't attacked me yet. So he pops his rune chance. Um, I go to 16 because I can't defend the arcane damage. He then comes in with, um, you know, a ninth blade, two meet and greets. I block just to stall him for the turn. And then I keep a blue and a red that I have an arsenal. And I can actually, can actually and attack him back for nine. Um, he wants to put the pressure on so he doesn't block. But then, you know, he's suddenly on 11. I'm on, you know, probably like, 12 or something like that and I still haven't lost tempo even though he's done this massive hit to me because he didn't have time to fully kill me in the one turn which meant that basically I was in a situation where I could come back and do whatever I wanted um and basically take the tempo back again because he didn't have the threat and I've played a few games against Viscerai and they've kind of gone the same way which is that Viscerai builds up but he doesn't necessarily build up fast enough to win um, against all of these decks. Now, if your meta is very heavy on control and slower decks like Control Katsu, on Bravo, um, on Aura, well, maybe not Aura Prism because the shields really do screw you over. But my point is that if your meta is full of control decks and slower decks, Viscerai is actually quite strong because he can turn around and just be like, okay, well, you want the game to go slowly? Cool. I want the game to go slowly too. Uh, here's 30 rune chance. What are you going to do? But if your meta is very aggro, it's very difficult to shot with Viscerai. Um, um, however, that being said, Viscerai is incredibly cool. Um, I personally love the Rune Blade aesthetic um, on Viscerai. Um, and I am in the process of building this deck to test. Um, I may, in fact, take it to the final Road to Nationals that I'm playing um, at the end of the month. Just because, obviously, I've already qualified. I've already won two Road to Nationals and got a load of playmats. I don't exactly need another one. Um, and I could play Katsu again, and that would be fun. But I'm kind of keen to play something else if I can get the practice in. That's the main thing for me. So I won't take something like Viserai unless I have the time to actually sit down and get the reps in. If I go to the Road to Nationals at the end of the month and I've had time to, say, play 30 or 40 games, then I'm going to consider putting something like Viserai down on the table. If I've only had the time to play, say, you know, 10 games with Viserai and maybe 10 games with Bravo and 10 games with Bolton and maybe I played a bit of Levia and I've just been having a chilled month where I've been playing a few games, helping my friends test, test whatever they want, then I'm probably just going to play Katsu again. Because for me as a player, I don't see the benefit of showing up to a tournament with a deck you haven't really put enough time into to understand the nuances. Because you can deck, you can deck, you can deck tech, you can um, net deck something from the internet, um, and you can get that sort of deck that someone's won with 
but if you don't understand the nuances of it, if you don't take the time to learn, and I kind of said this in all of my videos, but if you don't take the time to learn the edge cases of, oh crap, I've drawn an all red hand with Katsu, for example. What do I do here? Because I can't play everything. What do I pitch? What do I keep? What do I arsenal? How do I get the pressure, even though I have no resources to pay for all of this stuff? You know, and obviously you build your deck in ways that give you protect protection from that. In Katsu, you run the heart and cross traps, for example. And now, bad players, or I won't say bad, but people will often make mistakes. Like, for example, they'll use heart and cross trap for a more aggressive turn when they have a blue in hand that can pay for a surging strike. That's a mistake because you need the heart and cross trap for the turn when you have all reds and you still need to surging strike. The number of times when, when late game, I have a surging strike and a whelming gust wave in my hand. And essentially, all I need to do is break my cross straps, surging strike, whelming gust wave, and then I can pitch the other red in my hand for the Mugenshin, right? Trigger. If I need that, or maybe I draw a card off whelming gust wave and I can pitch that for Mugenshin, and I can arsenal something, right? But without heart and cross straps, that turn is ruined. So the worst mistake sometimes you can make, now sometimes it does make sense to do this if you have a really, really good hand and you don't want to spend one of those cards to play for the surging strike. But ultimately, most of the time, keeping those things to smooth out those bad turns is something you learn through reps. So when I say Viscerai isn't very good, I haven't played Viscerai super amounts, but I can give you a breakdown of how to play against him and what the main things to look for are. Obviously, if he's sitting there with 30 rune chance and he hasn't popped his skeleton yet, you may be kind of screwed. But if he's not dead by then, you probably haven't been playing fast enough into him, so you need to go more aggro into Viscerai don't treat it like a control matchup or you'll be too slow and you will lose. Um, yeah, that's it, really. Um, you can see even, like, when I say he's going to defend a lot, if you look at something like Rune Blood Barrier, you might be thinking, well, he's going to use his Rune Chance to kill me, so why is he playing Rune Blood Barrier if it blows up all of his Rune Chance? And the simple answer is I can get four Rune Chance for three, and then I'm just going to block so much because these work like prism shields they don't blow up unless i actually take the damage so i'm just going to block a load and then you're not going to get through to my rune chance or maybe you'll block your pop one but i'll still get the on hit effect for example so there's lots of little little things that you learn you know for example if you've got rune blood barrier out you're not just taking tons of damage and letting all your rune chance burn because that's also your win condition so really what you actually need to do is defend more so your rune chance don't get blown up um, and if you do that against, say, a Bravo and they're coming in for six with the hammer, you just block for six and then you've made four rune chants, right? But if you're playing that into something like Katsu, you're not just going to be able to block like four damage with a sink below and keep all your rune chants. If Katsu comes in for 18 in a turn, you're probably going to lose like 10 rune chants. And maybe, okay, he won't get his on hit effects, but you're still going to be losing that thing that's going to let you win the game. So that's really something to worry about. Anyway, I will sleep up this deck. I'll give you more thoughts on it once I've done that. Um, and I'll probably play it and have a bit of fun because I have all these cards because I used to play Chain. I'm just missing a Mordred Tide, I think, um, from this deck list. Uh, and maybe uh, become the Arc Knight. But that'll be easy enough to get. I'm not really worried about that. Um, so, yeah, that's it, really. I mean, that is... I hope this was a good summary. Um, if you disagree with me, if you think there's a deck that you will see in the top eight that isn't... Um, included in this list, please let me know. I'll happily talk about it. Um, I feel like there are some decks that have made it to top eights that I haven't talked about. Um, and there are reasons for that. I know that Kato was in a top eight once. I know that Levia has made a top eight once. Um, I just generally don't feel the need at this point to go through talking about those decks when they're not going to be in the Road to Nationals top eights that people are going to face. Um, if you come up against a Kato and you haven't got Null Rune in your deck, Try and kill him before you die. That's pretty much one line summary of that matchup. You're not going to be able to block any of his damage. Just take out all of your stalling cards, all of your defense reactions, anything that slows you down, and just try and kill him literally before he kills you. If you do it, you'll win. If not, he's going to he's going to burn you for like 16 damage, uh, maybe 32 damage in a turn, and you're going to lose. Um, against Levia, I have not actually had any no i've had one game against levia um big attacks good play against it like you would play against rider 
try and put enough pressure on her that she has to block. And then when she has to block, she's in a situation where she dies to blood debt. So if you can put the aggro onto Levia and get her in a situation where she's low enough that she has to block with her whole hand, you've already won. So don't worry too much about that. Um, and again, if you run into one of those in the top eight, I'll buy you a beer um, or some sort of non-alcoholic beverage, depending on your age. Um, as some of you may be 16 plus and not an old man like me. Um, but, you know, if you run into a deck I haven't covered here, I will... I don't know. I'll send you a promo or something. Just let me know. Um, unless it's Axis Dorinthia, because I'm not covering that for a reason. Um, <laughs> and that's it, really. Um, you know, if we see a Levia win a road to nationals, then I'll have to raffle something off to my subscribers. Well, I say that. I don't think I can see my subscribers until I get a thousand. So um, I may not be able to do that, but I might do some sort of like comment and you can get, you know, comment and subscribe and you can have a, uh, a slot in the raffle or something like that. Um, if we see, and that's important, if we see a Levia or a Kano win a road to nationals, I will raffle off um, something cold foily from my box. I've got a box of cold foils over there. I'll, I'll raffle something cold foil off, maybe a common or, um, you know, something like that. Just just as a thing, because I'll be so shocked. I can make, I can make that kind of bet. Uh, before people say it, I'm not raffling off one of my tunics. Um, those are my children. You you cannot touch them. Um, <laughs> though I am still selling one of those tunics just to cover event fees and travel and stuff like that because traveling to all these events is quite expensive and it does add up quite quickly. So if you are in the UK or Europe and you are looking for a extended art rainbow foil tunic and or playmat um, and or some adult cold foil heroes, do let me know. Um, you know, it's just... You know, it's it's one of those big ticket items. I don't expect to sell it, but obviously, you know, having paid, I think we're paying two hundred pounds just to go up to nationals. I paid one hundred and fifty to go up to another tournament. I messed up on a train and I got dinged for another sixty pounds because I bought the wrong ticket um, with a travel card because my app put it into the search and oh, it was a nightmare. And the guy wouldn't let me pay ten pounds to upgrade my ticket. He just charged me another sixty quid to, for a new one. So a lot of money has already got into these events. So, you know, if I'm selling off a few promos, it's literally just to make sure I can um, keep going to more, basically, with the uh, the funds that it takes to, to do those kind of things. Um, and that's it, really. Uh, so thanks for watching this video. If you've made it this far, if you're still listening, um, obviously, if you've listened for this long, you do have to give me a like and subscribe. Uh, those are the rules. Um, and uh, I hope you have a great day. And obviously, if you are playing in a road to nationals this weekend and any of the advice that I've given in this video or in this series, you know, or if you've taken my Katsu deck and you're winning with it, I really want to know, you know, let me know what the interesting things, let me know what helped you, if it was just a piece of blocking advice or if it was a strategy piece against a deck you haven't seen before, anything like that, just let me know. Um, I'm really keen um, to hear, you know, when these um, when this advice has really helped people um and you know get that feedback from you guys